Good morning, everybody. Uh, everybody here in the room, and then, of course, everybody watching on live stream or later watching on YouTube. Uh, my name is Fontaine Foxworth, and I'll be walking you through today how to best take advantage of the Places API, which is the technology that's responsible for actually distributing semantic information about places to you as developers with wildly different needs. Now, first, I want to start with the word place. When I joined the team, I asked, what exactly does place mean? And I was met with giggles. Well, it depends on who you talk to, was the response I got. We discussed, was there a more appropriate word or perhaps a more precise word to describe places? And over the coming weeks, I really started to grow pretty fond of the word. You see, place does mean something different to everybody, but there are a couple of common trends. Place is a place fundamentally because we as humans assign value to it. And Google cares deeply about understanding these places that are living and breathing and updating all the time. And so we take it upon us to, to have an up-to-date record of these places. Now, I moved to Sydney, Australia back in February. And when I got off the plane, I felt similar to how I imagine this girl here feels. She's getting her bearings, orienting herself. She's on a path. And in the same way, I, when I arrived in Australia, I adjusted my own internal GPS and tried to get familiar with my context. So I would bike around different neighborhoods, drink flat whites in different coffee shops, or read in bookstores. I was getting to know the place of Australia, but I was also getting to know neighborhoods and streets and shops. Now, I'll be taking you on a journey today, and this will go in three different uh, phases. The first phase, I want to actually explore what it means to be a place. We have this location stack that has all different levels of metadata about a place, and I'm going to talk you through how you can actually access different types of metadata about our places. Secondly, we'll be exploring several real-world applications and then the corresponding services within the Places API that you can use to actually meet those cases. And then finally, I'll be talking through how this is best accomplished through our mobile SDKs. So now, actually diving into that location stack. When we first started mapping the world, it was largely about charting courses. And so a latitude and a longitude and some math was usually enough to get from point A to point B. But this isn't necessarily the best way that we as humans understand the world. I'm showing you here a set of coordinates, a latitude and a longitude. 37.4 something degrees latitude, negative 122.1 degrees longitude. My guess is upon first seeing this, you don't automatically know where it is. Now, this is certainly helpful to us. Uh, and certainly, as uh, we input this kind of information into computers, it's powerful, for example, in a mapping API to actually plot on a map where this point is. We'll come back to those specific coordinates in a minute. But then we actually started to structure the world around us. We started to have postal codes, or house numbers, or streets, basically addresses. And addresses were certainly powerful in helping us structure and understand the world around us, and uh, critical for systems like postal services, where we're trying to get a letter to a specific destination. But as humans, I don't, we don't usually remember more than a couple of addresses. I know my own home address, maybe my parents' address. But beyond that, I really don't have any more. So there must be a better way for us to actually understand places in the world. Now, if we go back to those coordinates we saw earlier, and we add in an additional layer of metadata, the address, we can start to understand a little bit more about this place. Right? It's on amphitheater. It's in Mountain View. I'm starting to get a little bit more of a characterization about that place. But we as humans fundamentally understand and memorize the world around us with semantic places and their characteristics. So here is an image of uh, Shoreline Amphitheater actually taken at Google I.O. last year. I know that I'm sitting somewhere in the back right up on the lawn there, probably, when this image was taken. 
And so when we add that next layer of metadata onto those coordinates we saw earlier, we see that I was, in fact, talking about shoreline amphitheater. So now this place becomes a lot more real to us. I understand this as a human. And there's so much other metadata that we can associate with this particular place. So when it comes to a sense of place, it's not just geographic. It necessitates this human characterization. So I've actually started to fall in love with the word place precisely because it is so imprecise, because it means something to different to everybody. In fact, that's what makes it a place at all. Now, I read a lot, and my favorite author is a woman named Rebecca Solnit. I first encountered her when I came across an atlas that she had written, and it had 25 different maps, all of San Francisco. And each one of these maps was basically looking at a different level or layer of data about San Francisco and had a corresponding essay written about it. And her big thesis out of that was basically, a map is not a canonical definition or representation of a place. It's merely a layer of data that we choose to represent about a place. And you can have infinite maps that represent a place, which is why she was uh, creating an atlas. So she had a quote from a different book, which I thought was relevant and wanted to share. Places matter. Their rules, their scale, their design include or exclude civil society, pedestrianism, equality, diversity. They map our lives. Now, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And certainly, understanding physical, real-world places is critical to this mission of organizing the world's information. But as you can imagine, it's an immense task, and there are lots of challenges. So among these challenges, first of all, there are hundreds of millions of places in the world that we have a record of, not to mention the infinite places that we don't yet have a record of. So there's so much information out there. Secondly, places have a very natural life cycle. Businesses spring up, businesses close down. We know that about 10 to 15% of places are turning over every year. And then, of course, places can mean so many different things. So how I would represent an ATM in our database versus how I would represent a cafe or a hospital would all be very different. So I need a way to actually capture all the nuances of different types of places while still creating a scalable system. So where does Google get all this data? We collect data from a whole variety of sources and put it in a single place to make available to the systems that are actually using these objects. So I'll walk you through some of those sources now. The first is Street View. We have cars driving the streets of the world, taking 360-degree imagery of the places they're in. So we can create immersive experiences that we've heard a lot at Google I.O. this year. As the world becomes, there, there's potential for more virtual experiences. Having this sort of 360 immersive imagery is going to be critical to actually creating those. And it's not just cars. We have sometimes bikes getting 360 degree imagery. Even backpackers with uh, 360 degree cameras trekking the Grand Canyon. We also have satellite imagery. This aerial footage helps us understand a totally different aspect of the world and maps. This is more about geometry, so understanding if a building takes up a certain amount of space, what's its relationship to a road, what are geopolitical entities, and how are they structured. So getting this sort of imagery conveys a totally different lens of data. Uh, there was that movie, Lion, which came out recently, which I thought was a really powerful illustration of how a human could take a technology like satellite imagery provided through Google Earth and actually create incredible value in his life. Uh, it was a boy named Saru who I think was lost at the age of five or six in India. He had accidentally gotten onto a train and ended up hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from where he uh, was being raised. He ended up being adopted in Australia. And decades later, he went into Google Earth and was actually able to track down the train station that he had accidentally gotten onto the train at and find the f his birth family and reconnect the with them. So a really powerful way of how we can take technology as humans and create value for ourselves. 
And then, of course, we have business owners. Via Google My Business, business owners are able to come in and actually control how they're being represented to the world. So they can make sure their phone numbers are up to date, their websites are the correct ones. This is an example of a brewery who did this. Uh, I also connected with a woman in Sydney a few months ago who had a bed and breakfast and needed help actually getting set up with Google My Business because her visitors, the people who were staying with her, didn't want like written instructions about how to actually arrive at her bed and breakfast. They wanted to just be able to type it into Google Maps and have Google Maps take them there. So I was able to help her take ownership of how her bed and breakfast was represented on Google Maps to make sure that the right address was there and all the other information that she needed. And then, of course, we have the consumer applications, Google Maps. We all probably have Google Maps in our pocket and are using it on a nearly daily basis. And we all have the power to make modifications to uh, certain place entries. We can contribute content, whether reviews or photos. Here's an illustration of, of uh, trying to modify the Shoreline Amphitheater place. And I can only imagine that this particular channel will become more and more powerful as Google wants to empower its users to help us actually shape our representation of the world. And so with all of these data sources, of which I just covered four, we are able to bring them all into a single place and understand the relationship between different objects. And then we make it, of course, available to our users via Google Maps. But we also make it available to developers like you uh, to build cool experiences on top of. And that's via the Places API, which we'll be diving into some of the specific applications today. And before we dive into those applications, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our primary key within Places, which is the Place ID. This is the ID that helps you get all of the information and metadata about a place. Now, as we talked about, places can represent establishments like shops or bookstores. It can represent points of interest like the Statue of Liberty or the Sydney Opera House. It could be geopolitical entities like Mountain View or San Francisco, intersections, roads, addresses. Places can be so many things. And the primary key to all of these is the corresponding place ID. Now, there's lots of ways that we can characterize the place ID, but I want to take a moment to illustrate three. First, it's unique, so each key exists exactly once. Secondly, the place ID is ubiquitous, and that certainly you can use it throughout the place API, but you can also use it throughout some of our other mapping APIs or imagery APIs. So if I wanted to get the uh, Street View imagery for a specific place, I would just need to pass in that place ID to one of our Street View APIs. Or if I needed to get directions to a certain place, I could pass in uh, that place ID to some of our mapping or navigation APIs. And then coming back to that illustration that we looked at with Shoreline Amphitheater, with a single place ID, I can access all these different levels of this location stack from the latitude and longitude to an address to the semantic qualifier or other metadata about that place. So again, this single key that helps us traverse that stack. So now, let's look at a couple illustrations of how developers in the real world are actually trying to meet some of their place, place needs or mapping needs, and then the corresponding services they're using within our API to actually accomplish those tasks. The first I want to consider is real estate. And we're looking at some lovely aerial beach photography right now. And since I'm currently living in Australia, let's assume that we have an Australian real estate company. And our user is going to be searching for a neighborhood that they're interested in. And for the purposes of this conversation, we'll say that our user is looking for the neighborhood called Manly, which is one of our popular northern beaches near Sydney. Now, by using the autocomplete service, a user can actually come in and start typing M-A-N, and then the results are dynamically updating as the user is typing. And then they can actually select the result that's most relevant to, him, to them. So we're able to see that here being, uh, being selected with Manly Beach. Now, to take advantage of autocomplete, 
You can certainly use our API directly, or we also have uh, widgets available on both iOS and Android, where we take care of some of the UI in addition to uh, the API logic. So here's an example of how you could put in our fragment with this XML up at the top here. And then you can actually call that in the Java code listed here at the bottom. So you can see the place autocomplete fragment is the, the name of that um, fragment here. Now, after our user has identified to us that they're interested in searching within Manly, you probably have a bunch of listings, your real estate uh, website. You have a bunch of listings in Manly. And those listings are basically addresses. So you have a list of addresses. Now, and actually, to be able to plot these addresses on a map, you need to be able to uh, tell the computer basically where to put them. And the best way to do this is via our geocoding service. Now, geocoding is a way of taking an address and interpreting that into a latitude and longitude that a computer could then plot on a map. Uh, so here's an example of 93 West Esplanade, which is one of our listings in Manly. I can take this and convert it into the corresponding latitude and longitude, negative 33 degrees latitude, 151 degrees long longitude, and actually plot that on a map. We, of course, have the reverse as well if I'm trying to take a latitude and longitude and turn that into an address. But that would meet a different set of use cases, but worth calling out nonetheless. So that's our geocoding service. Uh, here is an illustration of us making a request to our geocoding web service. And it's a Python example. Basically, you can see that uh, the formatted address results are being displayed to our user in an array here. So stepping into our next application, photo tagging. We know that photos are a key part of us experiencing the world and sharing our experiences with people. And one of the first things that people often ask when they see an image is, where was that photo taken? It's because having a place associated with an image gives it that much more context. It helps you tell the story about that photo. So one of the key questions you're often asking when you're doing photo tagging is, where am I? Or where's my user? To answer this question, you can use our get current place API. This service is res uh, responding with a list of possible candidates of where that user is and a corresponding likelihood that the user is actually there. Uh, this is available on mobile. And I'll be talking a little bit later in the conversation about how we calculate that likelihood, what type of inputs go into that. Here's some Android code about how you can actually uh, use get current place. And you can see the get current place call, which is part of the place detection API namespace. Um, and we have this callback, which is an asynchronous call. And you can see we've got a buffer that's being returned, which is the list of places. And we also have the corresponding likelihood. Um, and then because we're maintaining the place objects, you can do things like calling get name, get uh, get likelihood, get ID. Because we're actually maintaining that place object, we're able to provide you with some helper methods to manipulate those easily. One thing to note is that when it comes to places and using places in your app, you as a developer only really need to store and maintain the place ID over time. Because as we talked about earlier, Google is taking on the project of actually keeping up to date all the places in the world. So we know that these places are living and breathing. So we want you as a developer only need to keep track of the place that you're interested in. And then you continue to ask us for what is the most up-to-date information using that place ID, which we talked about. We also have a widget available that's called the Place Picker, which fundamentally sits on top of this Get Current Place API. And you can see how we show users the different uh, places that are being returned. And then you put the power into the user's hand to actually select which place they're actually at. So instead of just assuming where they're at, if you want the user to identify which place they're at, you can do that via our Place Picker. Uh, here's an illustration of how you can actually uh, call that on Android. And then we have the same thing available on iOS. The third application that we're going to be exploring is travel and hospitality. And naturally, the types of questions that you're trying to answer when you're building a travel or hospitality experience are very different. And many of these have to do with discovering places. 
trying to understand what's, what's surrounding me, what's going on around here. And to, to answer this, you often want to issue a search. You want to ask us what's happening around here. Now, the search service is interesting because the actual set of results that you would get varies wildly depending on what your use case is, what your inputs are. Some of the inputs that could vary could be string. What is the actual string that you're inputting, and, and how, is that, how similar is that to some of the results that we are returning? What about proximity? Are you looking for things that are close to you, or are you looking for prominence, big popular cafes or restaurants around you? You can also input different biases so that we can actually respond differently or filter down the actual set of results that we could be returning. So I want to illustrate a couple of different examples of using the search service and how that could impact the results that you would get. In the first illustration, if I were to look for the string Sydney Opera, that's pretty distinct, and I'm most likely trying to get to the Sydney Opera House. So I would only respond with one uh, item, which would be the Sydney Opera House. It's pretty navigational, and I know exactly what I'm looking for. However, if I searched for a bookstore in Sydney, which is more categorical and I'm in expecting a list of results, then I could get that list of results. Here's an illustration of what that could look like. And uh, because it's an API, we would be returning it in, as a list. And a key part is understanding how it's sorted. How are we actually returning that information to you? And you can tell us, are you more interested in sorting by distance and, and really having proximity be the focus? For example, if I'm looking for bookstores, but I really just want to get a postcard, I don't really care about the bookstore, I just need to get a letter to send a friend, then sorting by proximity makes a lot of sense. However, if I'm trying to get an understanding of the literary culture in Sydney, then I might want to sort instead by prominence, because I want to understand what the most prominent bookstores in Sydney are and prioritize those. And then as we highlighted earlier, like a SQL query, I could actually limit down my results uh, by imposing some type of bias or restriction, like I only want to see bookstores that have a certain star rating or above. Now, once you've issued a search using our search service, you could get you know, a single place back or a list of places. So you have a bunch of IDs. And then the next question is, tell me more about this place. What is at this place? And in order to do that, you could use our place details service. Place details service allows you to basically access all of the metadata about a place. So not just the basics, like an address or the coordinates, the latitude and longitude. But of course, you can get the name or the type of a place. So imagine you're building a location-based game, and you need to understand where the bodies of water are because you want to keep your users away from bodies of water, and understand where the parks are because you want to be driving your users towards parks. So understanding types is really key to actually being able to shape your experience. You can also understand other characteristics of a place, see what the star rating is or how many reviews a place gets. To use that, you can call uh, get place by ID. So again, you would be passing us the ID, and we would res be responding with all of the metadata. And we have uh, those helper methods to actually allow you to do things like get name. So you can see how uh, we're first validating here that we are, in fact, getting a valid place object back. And then you can access some of those helper methods. So the final part of our journey is going to be exploring how this best manifests itself within our mobile SDKs. So certainly, places are available across several different platforms, including JavaScript, or you could just hit our web service directly. But I think places based best are taken advantage of on the mobile platform, so within our iOS and Android SDKs. And there's three reasons I want to highlight about why I think they are most best taken advantage of in this world. The first is that it, we are able to serve you more accurate results. The second being it's much easier to use. And then third, they've been optimized for performance. So starting with more accurate results. For this, I want to focus on the get current place service, which we talked about earlier. And we had talked about photo tagging. So here's an image of food. And let's say I want to be able to associate a place with this food. Now, many photos come with a latitude and a longitude associated with them. 
And while this is helpful, it can be problematic, I think, in two ways. One, I would never post a photo that said, check out this food that I ate at insert coordinates here. That doesn't really tell me anything about that food. Secondly, because I was indoors, the latitude and longitude might actually not be the most accurate representation of where I was. So it's being displayed here, but that might not actually be exactly where I was at that moment. Now, if I were to use geocoding, and this would actually be an application of reverse geocoding, which we talked about earlier, I could input those coordinates into reverse geocoding, and I could get an address back. Now, while certainly I could better understand and see that, OK, this, is, this place is on Castro Street, it still doesn't give me an understanding of where the food was eaten. And again, if the inputs of those latitudes and longitude were not accurate to begin with, then the output of the address is also not going to be accurate. However, with Get Current Place, which is only available on mobile, you can actually understand that we're at the Morocco's restaurant, which is across the street, across Fairmount Avenue, from the latitude and longitude that we initially plotted. And we're able to understand and infer this from a variety of inputs, which I'll talk you through in a minute. But this is incredibly powerful because we're able to understand more about some of the inputs that are there than just relying exclusively on the latitude and longitude. So like with many other products at Google, we are able to incorporate machine learning into actually understanding how users are navigating between these hundreds of millions of places that we have access to within Google. And so some of those inputs that actually are, are helping us understand are things like opening hours. So if I post this photo in the evening at 8 PM, and there was a sports gear store across the street, but that sports gear store closed at 5 PM, it is unlikely that I'm going to be at that place. So I'm able to deprioritize the, the fact that I would be at that sports gear store, even though from a geographic point of view, I might, my point, my uh, latitude and longitude might look like it's actually closer there. I'm also able to take in consideration things like popularity. By definition, things that have more foot traffic, you're more likely to be there, because people tend to spend more time there. Same goes for geometry. A place is not specifically just a point. It has a physical representation. So I'm able to understand by using things like our satellite imagery, which we talked about earlier, how much space a place actually takes up, and what's my relationship to that space. And then we're able to take advantage of a lot of the mobile signals that are only available on mobile platforms, like Bluetooth scans or Wi-Fi scans. So we're able to actually understand and, and triangulate from these representations of all these different inputs. And so based on all those inputs, and again, because Google can understand how users are navigating over hundreds of millions of places and actually applying machine learning to that, we can make a much more educated recommendation about where that user is which was a Mar Moroccan restaurant across the street. So secondly, our mobile libraries are easier to use. And this is for a couple of reasons. First, as I talked about earlier, we maintain the place object, and we create these helper methods that makes it easy for you to get different metadata about that place. So whether it's get name or get reviews or get URL, you're able to actually easily access the, that information in the place, uh, place object without actually having to parse the JSON yourself. And then the second reason is, of course, these widgets that I've talked about earlier. So not only are you able to take advantage of the logic that some of these services like autocomplete or place picker provide, but we're also giving you the UI elements. And these are controls that are very common in many apps. So why reinvent the wheel? with your precious developer cycles when you could instead be using that time to actually work on the things that matter to your business. So you can leave these sorts of UI elements to us, just plug it into your app, and then focus on the things that matter to you. And then finally, we've prioritized performance. So our mobile libraries are intelligent with how they're actually making network calls. We know that data is precious, and especially when you consider developing worlds. So we need to be respectful of our users and when we're actually making calls to our backends. 
And we also know that there are often familiar places that users are frequenting over and over. So we're actually able to do smart things like more on-device caching. So we're actually remembering if, for example, there's information about a place already available locally on the device, then we can just utilize that rather than making unnecessary calls to our backend to fetch new, fresh data. So we know that users are fundamentally creatures of habit. And so they're going to the same places over and over again. So we can reduce up to 90% of hits that would be unnecessary to our backend because that information is already available locally on a device. So today, we traversed a journey, and we covered three parts. We first looked at our location stack and fundamentally what makes a place a place. Second, we explored some real-world use cases and then the corresponding services that you can use within the Places API to take advantage of those. And then finally, we looked at our mobile SDKs and how this best comes to life on all the little computers in our pockets. So we're excited to see where you developers take your journey to create a sense of place in your own apps. Uh, a couple other call-outs. For those who are watching on live stream and for those in the audience, if you want to follow up on, on some of the services and APIs that we covered today, uh, you can check out our documentation on places. We also have more documentation around some of our mapping products. And then yesterday, my colleague Joel talked about making the world your own via uh, making the world your own via Google Maps APIs. So if you didn't get a chance to check out that session, I encourage you to look up that, uh, that title on YouTube, and you can rewatch the session. Uh, we just talked about a sense of place in your apps today. And then immediately following this session, my colleague Inker is going to be walking us through some new solutions that we've built on top of some of our Maps APIs. So I encourage you to stick around, or if you're on the live stream, uh, keep watching. And if you're unable to do that, check us out on uh, YouTube later. So uh, thank you for having me today.